So, clothing. Uh, people often have very strong misconceptions about the clothing of the past, like this chap um, who did this painting and had these people in these very rudimentary clothes which they barely have on and yet he, uh, she has a Neolithic axe and he has a rather nice bow uh, which probably um, they had long before they stopped wearing uh, a dead animal thrown around their loins in this manner except possibly this chap down here so that's a charming way i hope you're not having your dinner right now uh this is a louse a head louse i think it's a head louse Pediculus humanus capitus okay this is probably the body louse um the body louse Pediculus humanus humanus Apparently, according to its DNA, diverged from the head louse as early as 170,000 years ago, apparently. There are a number of, of papers on this. Um, and so the hypothesis is that although humans uh, would have had head lice to go in their hair for a long time, uh, since they didn't have much body hair, they didn't have body lice until they started having clothes. And why not? Uh, it's, it's, it's an idea. Um, the actual origin of clothing, of course, is, is very difficult. Uh, the earliest uh, needle, this is a very nice needle with a hole here for, for, for uh, putting, for sewing things up. It's from Denisova, uh, as about here, which is renowned as being where Denisovians come from. If you've heard about Denisovians, you know all about Denisovians. If you haven't, then never mind. But this is 50,000 years ago. Uh, that they had needles. So if they had needles 50,000 years ago, I'm sure they had clothes by the Neolithic. Talking of the Neolithic, this is a textile, quite a nice linen textile. This is actually was not a, a garment. <clears throat> it, it seemed to just be wrapped around the body of a child. Um, but it shows that uh, 9,000 years ago, there were textiles that you could make clothing out of. Uh, this is also linen but this actually is clothing obviously um, this is the earliest dress possibly the earliest garment that we have existing um, from uh, about 3400 to uh, 3100 BC and interesting it comes from somewhere where people don't necessarily have to wear clothes so it is another aspect of this. People often think, oh, well, people started wearing clothes because they went to cold places. Um, well, it's possible they started wearing clothes because they wanted to. Um, and so it's also another difficult aspect of the clothing. These are very cool. These are the world's earliest known trousers. Uh, they, they're from Yanghai, which is now in China, but is actually on the steppe. Uh, some of the southeastern part of, of the eastern steppe uh, which uh, would explain why they had trousers there's lots of horse related uh, other things found in this culture and in this actual grave and it's pretty evident if you know anything about horses that riding a horse with no trousers on is probably not a good idea people have done it um, I don't think it's what you want to do uh, for livelihood. And so inventing trousers were a very good idea. So let's get on and look at some fibers uh, since we can do that. So plant fibers include uh, flax. This is uh, the pale flax, which is not a common, nowadays a common uh, uh, plant for growing flax. But it's some of the earliest evidence for uh, use of, of flax. This is a fiber from this plant uh, from Georgia from you know, 30 to 26,000 years ago. And it was spun and it was dyed and knotted. Uh, so they must have been doing something with it. And, you know, we had needles since long before here. So it's reasonable to think they may have been, I don't know, sewing up clothes, if not making clothes with it. But... You know, very difficult to get that information. The better known uh, flax, Linum usitatisum, I think I got that right eventually. Um, this has a long, smooth, fibrous, cylindrical in shape, 
with a length of average of 15 to 25 inches. Why that's in metric, I don't know. I'll have to fix that one day. But uh, yeah, so this is a very long fibers. And you can see here is growing, very long plant with seed pods at the end. So this was domesticated in the Levant, it seems. Uh, first evidence from about 9,000 uh, years ago. Um, was introduced into Egypt by about 5,000 BC. So not very long afterwards. Uh, in Egypt, of course, it's very popular. Because with uh, flax, you make linen, linen clothing. So it's very popular. You can also make linseed oil out of the seeds, which is also good. So to examine a bit of the uh, sequence of production here. So you grow your your flax and here it is being pulled. And here, of course, they're wearing linen clothing. And you know it's linen because it's white. Of course, you can have white other clothing, but typically people like to have brightly colored clothes if they can. But linen, uh, being a plant fiber, most plant fibers are actually quite difficult to dye. The, the structure of the fiber is uh, very uh, inconvenient for that. And so typically when you see Egyptians, they're wearing white. Not because they like white, but because they like linen. And they make a lot of linen. Linen is very cool to wear, that is. And so you need to get rid of those seed pods which you can also, of course, make linseed oil out of. And then you do what is known as retting. Retting is here. And so these chaps are retting. Uh, you need to do this because what you want are these fiber bundles here. These are the fibers you want to get out of this plant. And so this woody uh, core, the shiva, it's known with a hollow space in the middle, and the epidermis, you want to break all that out and get the fibers. And so you ret it. Then you scutch it and heckle it. <clears throat> Sounds very unpleasant, really, doesn't it? So I think this lady is scutching it. She's just breaking it to get the fiber out. And these people are hecking it, heckling it, heckling it uh, to make it all nice and straight. So as I was saying, Egyptians love the white uh, attire. Uh, you can do all sorts of fun things with it, like... Uh, Supposedly starch was used to give it this uh, this folded look. So you starch it, fold it, and it can make it into a concertina. It's supposed to look very attractive. So wool. Uh, wool is uh, very important, of course. And you get wool from sheep. Well, also goats. Here's some goats. And camels. Here you can see the camels. Um, most of these animals will naturally... Um, shed their heavy load of uh, winter fur and this is an easy way to get wool um, before you develop the idea of shearing it off which is a whole lot of bother of course and of course with that you can make things like tents so wool structure uh, you can see the uh, a plant fiber made of cellulose tends not to have or will not not tends to will not have these, the structure in it, this is from it growing in follicles. And wool is particularly structured like this. And so it's very easy to take a dye. And so that's how we can tell these people are wearing wool. So these are uh, apparently referred to as Amu people. And you often find this in books and lectures about people coming from Asia uh, in Egypt. So these are Egyptians, you see, wearing their nice little linen skirts. Very cool and breezy for the hot Egyptian uh, weather. These people from Asia, supposedly, um, are wearing wool. And because they're wearing wool, apart from these two chaps at the back, uh, it's dyed. And it takes a dye very easily. And it has all sorts of different colors. And so they, they like all the colors. And uh, they wear them. And you may have heard of Joseph. Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat, as I think was a musical or something. But Joseph was uh, uh, had this coat of many colors, uh, which uh, was shown to his father, I think, if I remember the story right, to show that he was dead, when in fact he'd been sold in slavery to Egypt and had this whole thing in Egypt. But uh, he had this, this coat, 
Was it shown? I don't know. Anyway, so he had this coat. But as you can see, it wasn't just Joseph had a coat or a garment of many colors. It was pretty normal for these sheep herding peoples. Uh, including these guys. Remember this? Uh, the Young High Cemetery Trousers? This is wool. So these are very cool. They've actually been woven. The legs have been individually woven. There's no tailoring and cutting here. They wove the legs, the two legs separately, and then wove the bit that goes in the crotch, and then sewed it together. All made of wool. This is probably quite colourful when they made it too. So cotton. Cotton quite important. This comes from India. First evidence from about 5000 BC in the Indus Valley. And here is cotton. Uh, and it spread around the world in the Islamic period. Apparently during this time, the best cotton came from Syria, especially Hama and Aleppo. So uh, it likes the heat. So for cotton, you have the cotton pods or bowls. So these are actually seed pods. And attached to all this fiber are seeds and you want to get that out and this process of getting the seeds out is called ginning ginning is the word ginning so ginning is very important so let's look at silk silk of course comes from the bombix family moth and their larvae and they feed only on mulberry this is actually in spain uh, where silk growing was introduced in the islamic period and uh, these ladies are getting mulberry leaves from a tree in order to feed to silkworms. Uh, this came from China to the Middle East, uh, to Eastern Mediterranean, in, in the 6th century AD. And in the Islamic period, spread all over the Islamic world. And so it was very important. The most important export to Europe until the 19th century. Uh, because not like they could make it in most of Europe. So here are, we have some children in Lebanon in 1929, feeding mulberry leaves to the caterpillars. This looks like a lot of fun. So here, this is a more industrial production here. You see, these are the, the, um, the larvae in their coiled uh, silk um, thingies. Um, and they've been steamed, so the larvae are dead, which I guess was the nicest thing to do since they're about to, like, unravel the cocoons and so yeah so they're dead so they're dried uh, here's a silk farmer well one of these is a silk farmer who is selling the cocoons uh, to the owners of the silk fa factories and here's a silk factory so here the cocoons are soaked in hot water and the silk is unround and so what they do is they take they scrub it around a bit until they can find a, a the end of the continuous silk filament, which is uh, what the uh, cocoon is. And so they, they get the end of that strand and attach it to the end of something which rolls it around a bobbin. Here you can see a simpler operation. This is, this is actually a household operation. Where they are, where this young chap is weaving the silk around the stick, and then it's transferred to bobbins up up here somewhere. So, of course, with silk, silk's very important in the medieval period and in ancient times, where it was uh, imported from China into the eastern part of the Middle East uh, from early times, and you would have made all sorts of very nice clothing, which is now for the most part all rotted away. Very unfortunate. So, as a part of the examination of the sequence of operations, here is someone plucking carcass wool. Um, just pulling the wool off of a carcass. This chap is running a cotton gin. So it's a, uh, a mill which goes through the cotton, hand cranked, to pull out all of the seeds which you don't want. And this chap has a bow, but this is for using on wool or cotton, because how this is used is to floof it up. So here's this, this chap, and he's got his mallet, and he's banging on the bow, and that's floofing up this, so it looks all floofing. You can spin it. And this is a comb. This is a wool comb.
and this chap is cutting the wool to make it easier to spin. Now this is quite interesting. So at this stage we are ready to, s to spin the wool or whatever fiber you're using, or in this case, make felt, which is something you did without spinning. And so these are a series of, this isn't actually Lou Levine here, Lou Levine. This uh, Lou Levine was an archeologist at the ROM who was working in, the, uh, in Iran in 1973 and made a, took a series of photographs of this chap making a coat out of felt. And you start off with a pile of wool and he's using the bow here to, to froof it up, to make it all fluffy. And so he is banging the string and that fluffs up this wool into this fluffy wool. Uh, here he's got some dark wool, so he probably has black sheep and white sheep. And he's got some of the black here and he's making these long uh, strands which he's now laying on this big tarpaulin. So you can see he's created a pattern and now he's got all this foofy fluffy wool and he's putting on top. Lots and lots of fluffy wool and he is fluffing it up with his fluffing device and he's fluffing it all over. Lots of fluff and lots of wool. Big pile of wool. And now he's putting some dark wool, fluffing it up and putting it on top. That would be the inside of the garment when it's done. And so now he's rolling it up. He's squished it all down. He's rolling it all up. You see, he's got this uh, tarpaulin, which he's rolling up. And he's rolling it really, really tight. And he's tying it up and jumping up and down on it. So this is to squish all those fibers together. Remember that picture of, of the fibers? It's squishing them all together so they lock together. Rolling it around a bit more. Here's his wife, probably, telling him how to do it, right? So, yeah, now he's had enough. And he unrolls it. So this is the, uh, the side with, with the, uh, the last remainder. And so what he's going to do now is fold it over. So he's folded it over. And so now he needs to get the sides of the garment foofed together. And so he's just folding it over, and the foofy edges will go into the garment. Here he's uh, making the end, the sleeve, and there it is. But it's not finished because he wants to roll it up in another and the tarpaulin again and squish it together some more. And so there it's been squished together. Now he's like stretching it a bit and he's trimming it, cutting open the opening so he get it, can get into it. And there he is wearing his uh, nice felt jacket. It'll be very warm. And that's the back. So this was the design he was laying down at the beginning, with, of course, a goat on it. Or a sheep. It's hard to tell at this time. So this is, of course, what you make gurs out of uh, the felt um, tent. So if you don't want to make felt, you might want to spin your fiber. So spinning is a, a technique to twist the fibers together uh, to, to make a long cohesive length. So individual uh, fibers that you want to spin together range from two centimeters, we're metric now, uh, two centimeters for cotton and two meters for jute. And so, but to make a textile or to have uh, uh, something to sew something together, you will need quite long bits. So you draw out the fibers and you twist them. And there's actually a difference in twisting. An S spin is an anti-clockwise spin, and a Z spin is a clockwise spin. And uh, most of ancient uh, spinning is uh, an S spin. And you also have an L spin, which is no spin at all. Ply is when you twist together uh, some of this uh, uh, spun together fiber to make a thicker fiber, a thicker yarn. And so the, this can be one ply, two ply or several ply and must always be twisted in the opposite direction to the original spinning. So here we have some of these ladies. They have foofy probably wool here and this lady is spinning it. She's using a drop spindle. So this is some of the earliest uh, early evidence uh, the only evidence in many cases of thousands of years of, of work of making clothing for people to wear are uh, spindles. These are all from northwest Iran from the first millennium BC. And uh, these are very important in the archaeological record. And here you can see this chap using one. 
and so he actually has the uh, the floofy wool up his sleeve where it's nice and safe there and out of the way and so he spins it out and this twirls it around and and is that the force the centrifugal force is what twists it out into a yarn so you can see a close-up of one and so it twirls it around here as it spins and eventually they invented the spinning wheel this is the uh this our earliest image i believe of a spinning wheel uh, 1230 1237 it probably existed a lot earlier than that of course and we can see it spins but the actual business is down this end and here's a slightly late a somewhat later version you can see all these ladies with their spinning wheels this lady's got a hand so you have one hand here which makes this end go round and at this end you spin out the fiber and the the spinning of this makes it more consistent and here is uh, the fiber you're trying to spin at this end and this is the wheel going around she's probably not very convincing but never mind and here is a spinning wheel again from Hans Wolf's book and so you can see here is the fiber you're trying to and this is a cone here's the fiber you're trying to create and what this wheel is doing and so you're cranking this this is going around far more at a consistent rate than a spin a drop spindle would do and so this is going around far more consistently and so the fiber you'll be able to make and this doesn't look very convincing fiber here of course but the 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 the, the, the product of the spinning will be far more consistent and even because they're using a spinning wheel which is why they wanted to do it um unless of course you're really really good at spinning but it meant you didn't need to be so good in order to do it so that's it for our introduction to textiles.